Hey, have you ever wondered what it's like to shift a wireless drivetrain? Well, I have. As much experience I've had with electronic bikes, I've never owned a wireless ETAB bike. Uh, now's the time. Here we are. So this is a pretty lengthy video. So if you do want to navigate the video, skip the first build part where I talk through it and go to the SRAM AXS setup. You can navigate that in the description. There's a time code and you just click on the time and it'll take you there. Uh, you can also check out some of the HD B-roll footage I shot. It gives you a little bit of a closer look at the bike or also the weight of the bike near the end of the video. So I figured instead of doing a build video like I did for my checkpoint, I'm just gonna kind of walk through it. Uh, and everything you can kind of expect when you get a bike in a box from Trek. First of all, it's usually against their policy to um, ship a bike in a box directly to a customer. Um, but I've been in the bike world for quite some time. I've always built up my bikes for the last 10-ish years. Um, and just a bit of a disclaimer, I will, after putting this bike together, you'll see it's quite simple. However, there are a lot of complicated parts to it, so um, I'll kind of explain it as I go through, but what I'm gonna do after I put the bike together is I'm gonna take it to the shop, have someone who has more experience than me or just a different eye look at the bike and make sure that's safe to ride. So if you do ever build up a bike at home, I just recommend that you actually get a shop to do it or at least have them check it over after uh, just for your safety. So, so this is the way it comes. Seat frame all cardboarded up so the first thing I always do when I have a bike in a box is I put the seat post on so for a carbon bike or a trek in particular or if you have a carbon seat post or a bike with a carbon seat mast cap such as this you want to add some carbon gripper so carbon gripper is, is kind of like it's like a degreaser or sorry, a grease. And uh, you're just gonna take a little bit of the carbon gripper and put it inside the seat post. This just prevents it from slipping. And then you're gonna torque the seat post on. Just a little torque wrench. So these are super handy. They're set specifically to about five Newton meters and they're really good for seat posts and handlebars. Take the wheels out. Take the box of goodies out and then the bike itself. So Trek does sell a seat post clamp that protects these seat posts, but I don't have one here. So I'm just gonna carefully clamp it. Like so. Just gonna remove the extra protection from some of the areas. So this bike is a pretty tough bike to get right now. It's the Imond SL7, if I haven't already mentioned it, uh, with the ETAP Force wireless. And as far as I know, the bike is actually sold out until November. So I got pretty lucky. So on that crank arm was just some pedal washers. You're gonna wanna put those on to protect the crank. A little bit about the bike, the Trek Imonda uh, SL series is a what they call a 500 OCLV carbon uh, and what the 500 OCLV is is just a level of carbon fiber um, it's a way that Trek can categorize their carbon and it's kind of a mid price point carbon fiber but don't get me wrong it is um, it is a really nice frame it's really good quality it is three and a half pound frame, I believe. And the difference between the OCV 500 to the OCV 700, which is their top of the line frame, is uh, a pound. So you go from a 1.66 kilogram frame down to a 1.2 kilogram frame. Which I mean, it's quite a bit, but the frame doesn't really, for me, I don't particularly believe that the frame weight does a whole lot. It is more the property of the carbon fiber. So a higher OCLV 700 carbon fiber 
is going to be um, stiffer. The 700 series for carbon fiber is a NATO grade for it, for carbon fiber, so it's actually only carbon fiber that's available in NATO countries. And it's like 3,700 bucks for a carbon fiber frame. And we'll see a V700 carbon fiber frame. So yeah, the differences and the benefits to the 700 series carbon fiber is gonna be weight uh, and stiffness. So the benefit from carbon fiber in general is you can lay up carbon fiber to be uh, stiffer in certain areas while flexing in other areas. So bottom brackets can be very stiff and efficient. And um, seat tubes can have good compliance so they can flex. So, Although my checkpoint has a pretty phenomenal frame and aluminum is getting really good. I did contemplate building up an ETAP bike with the uh, Imonda ALR frame, the aluminum one, uh, the purple one, because it's such a good looking bike. Significantly better looking than this frame. So that's one of the downsides to this bike when I bought it was, this is such an old paint job. Um, it's a graphic they've used for quite a while and it's never been a graphic that I've liked. Uh, so that's a little bit disappointing. All right, let's put the handlebars on just to get them out of the way here. So there aren't too many tools that you need for five mil Allen key. They're aluminum bars and an aluminum stem, so you don't need carbon gripper. Uh, some people like to grease them, but I never do. So the bars are, are something that I just feel are, it's not necessarily under spec because of the price point of this bike, but bars are one thing that I upgrade because the performance benefit and the feel of a carbon fiber bar I think is superior to an aluminum bike and you can also drop quite a bit of weight going from an aluminum to a carbon bar. So I will be upgrading those. Now just to talk about the, the spec of this bike. Um, this is kind of in like the sweet spot for bikes that I can buy. Um, I did own a Damani SLR8 last time and uh, that was definitely uh, more expensive than I'm used to and I just sold the bike because it was too much bike for me. It had Durace on it um, but this bike coming in at around $7,000 Canadian is a, a little closer to my, my price point and the way it's specced is, uh, is quite nice so whenever I buy a bike I look for Whenever I buy a bike, I look for a few key things. So I look for carbon wheels, um, a good drivetrain. The drivetrain is kind of the least of all my concerns because man, even Shimano 105 these days is pretty phenomenal the way it shifts. I look for a good frame, whether it's aluminum or carbon. Like I said, the checkpoint has a phenomenal frame. It, it's worthy of being upgraded because of how good the frame is. But overall, this is a good frame. It's nice and light. It has awesome wheels. I've ridden these Aeolus Pro wheels for quite some time uh, and a super awesome drivetrain. So there's just a few little things that I would upgrade. Um, and I'll be doing that in a second video, part two of this. I'll be doing a few upgrades, but uh, uh, for the price, it's pretty awesome. So I'm just gonna take out this front through axle, put the wheel in. Put the brake caliper on. So in the box you have an owner's manual, generic. It comes with every single bike. You have these uh, frame protector stickers, which I usually put on to pr protect from cable rub. But this bike might not have a much. Yeah, right here in the front. If you don't put a frame protector there, it does wear that paint out super quick. So this little bag of goodies here has just some reflectors in it. and some adapters for the stem for computers. And Classic SRAM always has Torx bits for all their stuff. It's been so long since I've owned a SRAM bike, a road bike rather. The last thing I had that had SRAM road stuff on it was a cross bike. So we'll pop the wheel in and we'll tighten down those brake caliper bolts. This rotor is just a little bit bent. Bike companies are required by law to ship with reflectors on them. It's 
obviously one of the first things that comes off. And we'll remove the dork disc as well. So now we're going to set up the force ETAP wireless drivetrain. Um, before this, I just uh, tensioned the spokes on the wheels and set up the brakes just so it's not rubbing when we go through the drivetrain setup. Um, it does recommend that you check out the owner's manual just like every drivetrain. I've never set up a wireless ETAP drivetrain, but I think it's pretty straightforward, so we'll just walk through it. Uh, you have your limit screws just like any regular drivetrain. Um, and so the next step will be to kind of unbox. So in the box, you're gonna get a charger. Just a little USB-C thing. Cable and your two batteries, which I already charged. The nice thing about this setup is Unlike DI2 drivetrains, is you can always have a spare one of these guys. I'm not sure what they cost, but you can have a spare one in your seat bag in case you need. And you can also swap them from front to back. Say if you uh, wear out the, the battery in the back, you could pull the one off the front of the railer and pop into the rear trailer just so you can get home. So there's a little protective case on it. Pop that off. Flip up the little hatch. Pop the battery in, super simple. The front shifters have coin cell batteries in them. So I guess the only downside is you might need to pack a few coin cell batteries in your seat bag. Or, you know, if you have a team car that follows you. All right, the moment of truth. Oh man, that was easy. So I've downloaded the SRAM AXS app. And all I've done with the app so far is put my username in. And created an account. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna search for parts. So I have a rear derailleur popping up. So every component has a tiny little button. And before you set it up, you have to push these little buttons as I just did on the front shifter and update the firmware. All right, that's done. Gotta reconnect every single time. That seems as though half the time the app freezes and you have to reopen it. So here just gives a breakdown of how the gears shift. So your left lever will shift down, right lever shifts up, and a combination of the two shifts the front derailleur. It's, you can customize it, but there's not really too many options unless you just want to reverse your left and your right. So the SRAM AXS app does have an enhanced mode, which is very similar to the Shimano sequential shifting. Basically it just works to smooth out your gear ratios so you're transitioning up or down as smooth as possible. I found that it just ended up shifting my front derailleur when I didn't want it to and I couldn't really prepare for it. So generally I would let up on power when I'm shifting my front derailleur, but I really didn't ever know when the front derailleur was going to shift so it, it made it a little bit weird. I didn't like it and ended up opting out of it. That's pretty much it for the app. Now we got to figure out how to adjust the gears. Super annoying. You want to work on the bike and you want to shift the gears, you have to shift both levers at the same time. 
makes it a little bit difficult. This is your bicep and your index finger. Not the best shifting right now, as you can hear. So the way to do this is uh, first we'll set the gear into the second biggest cog in the back. The limit screws have already been set. So now we will fine tune the gears by using the trim function. All right. So then those little buttons I was telling you about, what you do is you hold the little tiny button, basically the pairing button while you shift the shift lever at the same time. So this allows you to micro tune the gears by moving the chain up or down a fraction of what a normal shift would be like. This allows you to center the chain on the cog, preventing it from rubbing on the cog above or below. There's no reason you couldn't do this while you were riding. Your gears aren't shifting properly. Cool thing about the Force ETAP system is that it actually won't let you cross shift. So I can't even shift down into my smallest cog. The derailleur won't let me. So first impression is it has it definitely has a SRAM feel to it. SRAM to me has always felt a little um, crisper, stiffer spring type feel. I wouldn't say clunkier is the word, but it's definitely not as buttery smooth as Shimano. And I'm fine with that. Shimano DI2 shifts super buttery. Well, that's that. It didn't take me too long considering I've never done it. SRAM Force wireless ETAP, very simple system. Uh, let's just hope I don't have uh, the same problem as Malcolm Molema. Malcolm Molema with a mechanical issue. And lastly, we're just going to set up the bike to my fit specs. One of the many benefits to having a fitting done. Well, that's almost bang on. This bike is almost perfectly set up for me already. Fancy that. Now just a heads up, you never want to torque this top bolt down. All this top bolt does is hold this all together. If you torque it down, you can actually pull the flange that's in the steer tube up out of it. And then you won't get this compression that keeps it together and can be a little bit dangerous. Last thing you want is a speed wobble because your headset is loose. Yeah, you do torque these ones down though, the stem bolts. It's very important as well that you do torque them down because if you just hand tighten them on, if you over tighten them, you can crack your steer tube. It's dangerous also. And we'll be cutting this off once I get my new handlebars. Now we'll weigh it. Trek was bang on, 17.16. And Trek claims that it's 17.12 pounds. We're 7.77 kilograms. And 7.79. And that is super impressive that Trek is that close. And there you have it. end of the video make sure you comment in the description tiny little buttons so i know you made it to the end also stay tuned for part two of the amanda build where i'll be doing some upgrades giving you guys some of my input on the bike and what i think is good and bad about the bike uh, and also check out my uh, social media landabikes.com facebook and instagram for any future stuff i have coming up thanks for watching